My mom said I could be anything I want <laughs> if I believe. <laughs> um, mm. All right. I don't. Hi, everyone. We're here again. <laughs> My name is Jeff. <laughs> uh. Uh. So you want to start with wheel or painted exterior? Uh, I guess we can talk about the, the exterior. And then if we want to go down to wheel, then come up to control arm, then work underneath. Exterior, wheel, underneath? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. So, ready? <clears throat> Yuppers. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Mineral Live. I'm here with Kevin, and today we're going to be talking about the EV9. And so the Kia EV9, just to be clear. It's one of the largest that we've seen come from vehicle, or, jeez, we're going to restart this. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Mineral Live. I'm your host Jordan and I've got Kevin with me today, so the brains of the operation. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about the Kia EV9. So the EV9 is one of the larger BEVs to come from Hyundai Kia and um, not surprisingly when Kevin and I looked at the underbody and even before actually, <laughs> we were sort of joking about the fact that like, man, we should get a, we should get video of us taking the aero shields down to show how, oh, Yes, it's, it's the same Kia. as all the other Kia's. Yeah, yeah, so. and that's not bad, right? Uh, there's, there's a lot of benefit in doing that, right? Economy of volumes, economy of process, they don't have to reinvent the wheel, figuratively speaking. So we're gonna see a lot of that underbody. Um, but before we get to the underbody, we wanted to talk a little bit about what we're seeing from an exterior's perspective. You know, often, um, not often, many of the OEMs and startup clients, automotive, any industry really, is asking us to look at cost. How do we get cost out of our product? How do we increase our margins? More importantly, how are competitors releasing X, Y, and Z products into the market space? What levers are they pulling in order to reduce costs on a product? Well, when I look at Kia, we'll talk about, in my opinion, and in Kevin's opinion, some very specific things that they do so as to appeal to their customer base, right? So where they're placing um, the money, if you will, in a program and where they're saving costs. So before we get to the underbody, Kevin, you know, maybe just give some highlights as far as a few of the things that we saw on the exterior. So I think one of the things that's interesting is, um, actually there's even some subtle detail right here in the grill. Um, there's almost no molding color uh, on the body exterior at all, at least um, anything from essentially the lower door trim up. And they're, they're using just these, these edges right here. So this is molding color as an accent and then kind of like necessarily for stone peck as well. But almost everything else is painted. All this cladding and cladding is expensive. It's, I, I don't like cladding. I think it's, it's costly, There's a lot of fasteners. You don't necessarily need it. You're already painting these surfaces. But that said, one of the things that Kia does do is they typically don't do any backers on the back side of this. So essentially they'll mold all their dog houses for their clips and fasteners into the, the base part itself, um, which has a class A appearance and then they'll paint over it. Um, so they're, they're able to execute that in a manner that they don't get read through on the parts right. um, through the vast majority, at least of a wheel flare or, or a fascia. So sometimes they do do localized um, reinforcements or backing panels, but typically speaking, they're pretty good at not doing that. And that's a, that's a real big cost center for them. So you're getting rid of a heat staking operation, a whole nother layer of plastic underneath it. And it allows you, as, as Jordan was kind of saying, to, to put money really where the customer actually sees it, right? And then with all this painting, that's something that you see from the exterior. And then as you start you know, going into layers that are not visible to the customer, yeah. um, you'll see a lot of low cost, you know, executions demonstrated by Kia and even in the interior, you know, essentially belt line and above, lots of wrapped interior pieces, painted pieces. And then as you start going down, mold and color. So the value proposition to the customers is very apparent to them from the exterior and both on the interior as well. And if you're wondering what doghouse is, that's a reinforcement on the backside of injection molded panels. Maybe we can show you uh, a quick example of that. I don't know if that has one. It doesn't one. really have any, um, yeah, this is a similar feature, but um, you can see here. So this is a painted wheel cover. And then on the back, everything is molded in. So on some, some OEMs would essentially have a separate panel that they're heat staking, um, vibration welded or something like that to, to get these features because they are concerned about read through. But one of the things you can see here, it is a pretty thick part in general. Um, so that is one potential downside. But typically speaking, if you're double layering parts, there's a lot of material there anyway. So 
this could be referred to as a doghouse, right? Some feature that is uh, either proud or pronounced something like this in order to house a, a fastener on the back side of an injection molded part. So just trying to keep everyone in the loop with us. Um, so, you know, continuing Kevin with the theme on paint that we're seeing on the exterior, certainly a lot of costs, a lot of OEMs, you know, that we've worked with would be like, oh my God, I can't believe they're putting so much paint in there. Um, when we looked at the wheel, this, this was an exemplary version of that. So you look at the, the wheel and you say, okay, just a black wheel. Well, it's a cast aluminum wheel. The cast aluminum wheel is likely powder coated black, right? So there's a painting operation there. But then they put a cover over the wheel that obscures, I'm gonna say almost 100% of the wheel. And so they're doing a high gloss paint application on a cast aluminum wheel, which is already not super prone to corrosion necessarily, a little bit of oxidation, but then they covered the entire thing up with a rather substantial wheel cover, which is painted and not only painted, it's masked and painted, right? So this is a polished tool to get this injection molded surface, right? This high, high shine. And then they're doing a masking and painting operation to get the silver here. Then on top of that, they take a wheel hub cover with this sort of spring retention mechanism that's snapped into the backside of it. This wheel cover has a threaded in piece that has the sort of like brushed aluminum um, Kia logo in the back of it. That may just be a molded plastic, right? I'd have to look at a little bit closer at that. But the point being with this whole wheel, that's a phenomenal amount of cost on each one of the corners of this vehicle, right? But as a customer walking up to that, to me, that's, that's a lot of appeal. So these are some of the things that Kia is doing in order to give you kind of that wow factor as a customer walking up to it. So all that being said, maybe now we can start to go underbody and talk about what they did in the opposite direction in order sure. to mitigate some of their costs. So it's funny, we were, we were just talking about this not too long ago um, with respect to these manufacturing enablers. So they're just bolting um, the calipers to the hub. The Cybertruck omits these. Um, and you can see someone is not only, they're not only in place, they've been checked as well. So there's a quality check there, which is interesting. Um, but overall, you know, Hyundai Kia essentially does largely, completely, you know, stamped steel body structures, lots of stamped steel also in the suspension. One thing that's interesting here, we are starting to see a little bit of divergence. It is a bit of a lot larger vehicle, but the overall execution is, is pretty much similar to every Hyundai Kia vehicle I've ever seen, specifically the EVs, which are now getting a little bit heavier and there is a little bit more offensive crash structure. But um, as we kind of come under the vehicle, this cradle looks very, very similar to the Ionic and the, um, the EV6 that we've seen, but um, this is doing a McPherson virtual ball setup um, and the front lower control arms are aluminum. So that is one interesting departure from our last vehicle that we tore down. They were stamped steel. Um, and so you can see here that they're, they're, they're particularly targeting some driving dynamics here with doing the virtual ball, right? So it's an interesting departure from some of the other vehicles that we have seen and trying to really you know, target in on that more premium segment, given the, the price class of this vehicle, it's, it's relatively expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if you're wondering what a McPherson strut is, so McPherson strut means that the coil and the shock are one, they are the primary connection point structurally and dynamically between the top of the knuckle, which is the, the silver cast uh, aluminum, this may be forged actually, aluminum knuckle that's going up to the shock tower up above, meaning if that goes away, there's nothing to support the top side of this. So this strut is doing multiple jobs in a McPherson. Although uh, if you talk to anyone who's really gonna geek out about the driving dynamics and so forth, may not perform as well as an SLA, for example, where you've got double, you know, or double wishbone, right? There's uh, several names for different suspension systems. But that virtual ball to Kevin's point is gonna move out um, the, the virtual ball joint, the connection point. So if you were to theoretically draw a line through these two, where do those converge? Um, that's actually gonna be the pivot point of your wheel, figuratively speaking. Now, looking at the cradle to Kevin's point, it's, it's a stamped steel weldment. When Kevin was referring to the offensive SORB countermeasures, um, a lot of that is up in the front here. So SORB stands for Small Overlap Rigid Barrier. It's a safety test conducted by IIHS, whereby 
they measure the total vehicle width, they take the outermost 25% of that, um, they'll strike a line, they'll line up the vehicle, um, and then they'll, they'll take a vehicle into a barrier. And really what all this structure out here is doing is helping to quickly engage with that barrier early on in the event and really help kind of glance the vehicle off of that barrier um, and keep ultimately the occupant home, the battery, all the rest um, in a safe condition, right? And not necessarily to, to pick fun, but one thing that we were, we were looking at, so this is one of the coolant lines that are running, it's running outside the rail, which they typically don't do. Um, and then it's coming through, and this is kind of interesting. So typically we, we see like for dynamic parts, Jordan, what do you think? 15 to 25 millimeters of clearance yep. is what you, what you would prefer. So um, they're controlling it here to try and keep the movement. They're also controlling it here to kind of keep it um, as fixed as possible. But it is definitely like a, a high hurt, high pinch area for that line to route through there. But as when you look at essentially there's a wheel envelope here and they are trying to keep it off that as much as possible as this line kind of runs through. That's just one thing that was a little bit interesting to me, um, seeing how close it is. And it's essentially just a packaging compromise that they, they had to essentially do and, and live with going forward. Um, yeah, as we, as we go a little further rearward, we look at the drive unit, um, the steering rack, all these things. They did go rear steer, so packaging the, the EPS, or electro power, electronic power steering unit, just aft of the motor. Um, it does look to be a concentric setup, so the motor is in line with the, the axis of the axles, the CV axles, right? So all those are in line. Um, pretty, you know, good from a overall packaging perspective, both on the Z axis, top down, as well as fore after in the X axis um, for those CAD spinners out there. Um, but other than that, I'm not seeing anything overly novel or new. Again, very similar to a lot of the other Kia vehicles that we've seen come through the building. Yeah, yeah and you know, if we were to look at even just some of these provisions here, you know, why I said it looks like everything, every other Kia that we've seen here, they're all tailored and you know i think it's one of the misconceptions of even toyota that essentially all their parts are common and they essentially just kind of replicate things going through where in fact when you really get down to the details they're they have common strategies at a high level where they understand that you know this will perform a certain way but they're 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 adjusting um, to the needs of the vehicle as they go through and i think for you know on for toyota's case i know it's not toyota you know they obviously have mass manufacturing all across the globe and there's restrictions for various markets that you're building vehicles so they're never as common as a lot of people like to think but a common strategy lets you move quickly because you're essentially you understand what you're working with the risks you know to both manufacturing the processing the timing everything like that it helps you get essentially a series of vehicles which i think i'm not sure if anybody has any more evs on the road than hyundai kia um but it allows you to get essentially a whole plethora or a suite of vehicles out relatively quickly because they're essentially copy and pasting and then adjusting for that particular vehicle's target sets. Yeah, the, the EGMP, right, the Electric Global Modular Platform, which is what this is largely based off. This is the larger on their scale of um, vehicles on that platform. Um, there, there's definitely some trade-offs, but there's a lot of replication that, again, economies of scale, volume, um, commonality in the build of process that they're really able to, to leverage. Now from us as reviewers and trying to see new stuff, not always the most exciting thing to get underneath of, um, but nonetheless, it is interesting to see which levers and knobs that they as an OEM pulled in order to execute different size and different market driven vehicles off of the same platform. And you know, we, we talked about the aluminum control arms. It may make sense from a volume perspective to go to a more expensive material and strategy just because when you get your, your costs back for stamping dies and based off the time of the vehicle, how long it's gonna be in production and just the cost of setting up a stamping line, the volume is low enough, this may come out to be, you know, um, actually the cheaper route to go forward. Um, more specifically, A-arms are very difficult to get, you know, good costs on just because they're shapes. Anytime you have these weird profiles and you're constantly changing, it's, it's hard to nest and get good utilization for materials. So very quickly, when you do a lot of welding with odd shapes, it can get costly and it can put you right into you know, forged cast aluminum, you know, control arms, whatever, whatever meets your targets and your thresholds there. So that, that is one thing that's interesting. I know we're talking about low cost, but this, for this volume and take rate of the vehicle may be actually the way to go and get to them to the price point that they need. Yeah. 
Moving rearward, looking at the leading edge of the battery pack, some of the thermal management, low voltage in black, high voltage in orange right here, it connections to the battery pack. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at the overall sort of to architectural topology of the vehicle and where the, the major structural um, pieces or monuments of the vehicle are lining up, both fore aft, cross car, and in Z, right, top down. So the cradle and these points right here on the battery pack are quite well aligned, meaning if you were to get into a fairly severe impact, um, God forbid, this, which is one of the primary connection points for the leading edge of the battery pack, is set up like a crush can of sorts. Um, so it's one of the first points of contact where anything's gonna reach a point of like stap up, stack up, as we would call it, where all these things are sort of clashing together during the vent. This is gonna help protect the battery. And moreover, if you look at how they nested further back in the battery pack from a 4 aft perspective, their high voltage, the thermal management, all of their crucial connections for the battery, these are really pro providing sort of that leading edge protection to the pack as you go forward, right? As these things start to collide. So different strategy, it looks like at some point in time, right? They, they are expecting um, or provisioning for and, and protecting against some of, those, some of those events to occur. Looking at the underside of the battery pack, um, they've got a, a pretty large shield that both has kind of a urethane or like an RTV, um, it's tough to, tell at certain junctions on the battery pack. It does look like uh, they've got some through bolts more than likely. So these are likely making connection all the way through the battery pack into the body structure. Um, I believe their, their counterparts on the GMP platform did make some through pack, pack connections. So with this much mass on a unibody structure like this, they need some way or some manner of controlling all of that mass and making structural continuity um, occur between the pack and the body in white, you know, the sheet metal above it. And this is a way to kind of help some of those, uh, essentially like th those modal or those pumping events to help mitigate that and really create some structural continuity underbody. One thing that's kind of interesting given how many of these they, they do have is they're still, you know, largely using an extruded aluminum, you know, housing itself. Um, it's great because capital wise, it's relatively cheap to get into extrusions. Um, but, and it's essentially a, uh, a sample size of one. Jordan's making fun of me because I'm like squatting under here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that, you know, they have a lot of, they, a fair amount of volume with these vehicles, um, but our, our sample size of one being Tesla, right? Where you see probably in some instances, third generation plus of packs, you know, they have, they've started essentially migrating completely into stamped housings with internal reinforcements, be either, either castings or extrusions. Um, but I think it's still interesting that they're still in the, the extruded game. Um, that doesn't necessarily surprise me given the commonality and they want to kind of stick with this. It'll be interesting to see for their next set of vehicles, whether they're going through major top hats or mid-cycle actions or all new vehicles, whether or not they get away from the extruded aluminum housings. Yeah. The, the overall, um Rear end of the vehicle, again, very similar to some of the eGMP vehicles that we've seen come from Hyundai Kia. Um, one of the things, though, specifically, is we talk about platform um, sharing, right? Multiple vehicles in the same platform. How do they stretch? How do they get bigger? How do they shrink and accordion the size of the vehicle? One of the big things that you see on the rear end of this vehicle that really gives the perception of size on the trailing end is their entire fascia strategy. So if you look at where the body in white terminates, so it's kind of like this, this e-coat plus the paint, this blue color, that's all the sheet metal on the body in white. If you look at where all of that stops, you'll see that in all of the fascia, you know, uh, not 360, but 270 degrees around the back end of this vehicle, roughly, you'll see that um, the fascia extends well, well beyond where the sheet metal stops. So one provision that's, or rationale as to why they're doing that is because they've got crush cans for rear impact and the bumper beam, which is compatible, composite, by the way, which is notable. Um, but then the other thing that they're doing is they're coming further down. So it really gives the uh, perception of this sort of athleticism. The body really wraps around the wheels, um, but all while not actually creating a much larger vehicle, right? So a lot of the the visual mass, I will call it, beyond the sheet metal, is largely injection molded, it's largely fascias, and I'll say sort of aesthetic, superfluous exterior stuff. It's not so much structure outside of that one bumper beam, which most vehicles are gonna have in a similar location, but it's allowed them to really square off the back of this vehicle. 
if you remember the, the Ford Flex, which is now out of commission, um, but a vehicle from Ford not too long ago. It's got similar proportions in the rear, very squared off, um, but quite spacious for what it was in the interior. They're, they're getting a, a very similar look by sort of extending or stretching some of this via the plastics in the back. One thing that's kind of interesting <clears throat> with the wheel liners, and there's like, I would say turmoil in the wheel liner uh, industry and, and conversation. So these are, you know, compressed kind of PET wheel liners. They're fibrous, so they, they're, they're big NVH enablers. But, you know, we're, we're seeing lots of conversations about later in life as these become waterlogged and dirty. Um, they don't perform as well. So you as a customer, start your benefits start to taper off where some, so we, some OEs are having conversations about, should we just pull these, get the cost savings now? Because ultimately down the line, um, they, they become compromised in their performance. But you can see even here, it still wasn't quite enough. They have essentially some additional MDH provisions um, on the backside of these wheel liners. One thing I did wanna point out when we were talking about the control arms. So um, these appear, and if you can do it, it's the best way too, to be non-handed you know, um, control arms themselves. There's, typically speaking, if they were handed, you'd see them in the casting or the forging themselves. Um, they laser etch, and this is what we saw in the Ionic as well. You know, they come in after the fact and then they decide whether or not it's gonna be left hand or right hand. Um, so again, when you're setting this up, it is one set of tools for both sides of the vehicles and it makes going into aluminum, you know, a more premium material, <clears throat> excuse me, um, much more accessible. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Other than that, any other observations, Kevin Underbody, um, before we go ahead and close this one out? No, I, I just wanna make another point on the composite rear impact. Yeah, yeah, so please. it's uncommon. They've done it for a very long time and through a whole series of, of vehicles. So it's something that we've talked about with numerous customers time and time again. There's lots of interest in it, but it's, it's interesting to see that it hasn't really been replicated um, through the rest of the industry as much. But Honda Kia continues to use it. So yeah, it, it is interesting. You know, we've typically it's going to be one of three things. It's either going to be steel, mostly extruded aluminum, or it's going to be like what we're seeing um, on this vehicle, which is composite. Um, it's not always a weight savings looking apples to apple. We've seen some very light aluminum executions. Um, but the nice thing about it is, you know, you, you've got a lot of formability given that it's right. injection molded, right? With the aluminum um, extrusions, you got to do a lot of secondary operations, bending, drilling, machining in some cases, depending on how you mount it. Um, but yeah, I think back in uh, mid 2010s, like 2014, 2015, we were seeing them on Kia Sorentos, I believe. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting to see that next generation, new platform, BEV application versus ICE, larger segment of vehicle. Um, to your point, they still use a composite beam. Yep. They do have steel crush cans where we have seen them integrate that on sure. older vehicles. So that could just be a, you know, a factor of the mass of the vehicle and what they're protecting for. Yep. Um, but materials, material properties, there's the best one sometimes for the job and sometimes you need to blend them. But uh, no, other than that, I mean, it's, I mean, it's pretty neat looking, I guess that's subjective, but yeah, um, indeed. yeah, that's it. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, if you're interested in more questions uh, or you've got uh, follow-ups, interested in reports, things like that, please reach out to us at sales at leandesign.com and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.